Hey folks, this is Dr. William Clark for the Dr. William Clark Podcast. Welcome back to the podcast. I want to uh, jump into this topic of uh, defining your operational philosophy. And uh, this is important uh, for us to talk about uh, because you as a nonprofit organization, you're going to be confronted with all types of opportunity that will be presented to you uh, to uh, leverage support for your work. And uh, this is good news, right? It's good news when you have a funder and a supporter who says to you, I want to support your work and I want to support the work that you're doing. And as a consequence of that, uh, we want to transfer money to your organization. Now, as we know, this process takes place by uh, a process called responding to an RFP uh, through a grant opportunity that's been presented to your organization. And when those opportunities are presented to your organization and you're successful uh, at landing the opportunity because you wrote an awesome proposal, uh, you wrote an awesome idea, you had the right partner, you had the right budget, all that good stuff, it then creates the opportunity for transfer to happen, i.e. you land in the grant opportunity. Now, when you are receiving these grant funds or tapping into funding or even, let's take a step back, right, even looking for funding opportunities, uh, you're looking for funding opportunities that are going to align with your operation that are going to align with who you are as an organization, as an institution, as uh, as an organization that's desiring uh, to achieve a core set of goals. When the money comes in, what's going to sustain you is not necessarily just your your uh, your operational excellence. It's not just the fact that you know how to write a grant. It's not just the fact that you know how to operate a grant. What's going to sustain your organization? Above all else, even though we know financial sustainability is critically important, even though we know that it's going to uh, be required of you to become sustainable financially, what's going to sustain your organization above all else is your operational philosophy. How are you defining the way you do business? How are you defining the way that you're going to operate your business? How are you defining the way that you're going to deliver on services to customers who are going to depend upon you. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, it is critical. It is critical that you understand the philosophy by which you are making decisions, by which impact is being had or being driven by. It is important for you to understand the philosophy that drives understanding, that drives relevancy, that drives impact, right? It's all about this operational philosophy. I want to share uh, two things with you that's going to help you frame up your uh, operational philosophy. Uh, once we wrap this up, I'm going to invite some folks to come and engage in the conversation here uh, on Clubhouse and to be a part of the podcast. Uh, but I really want to work with you and help you think through this, uh, this idea of defining your operational philosophy so that you, as a budding nonprofit entrepreneur or nonprofit leader who is Leading an organization that's maturing, you have the framework, the idea that's going to help you understand this concept even better. Now, I want to start with the first of two ideas, and that is uh, the idea of building a self-leading organization. All right. When you're developing your philosophy, your operational philosophy, it begins with developing a self-leading organization. What does that mean? A self-leading organization comes from the idea from Dr. Charles Neck and Dr. Charles Mann, uh, Christopher Neck and, Chris and Charles Manns, where they talk about self-leadership as a concept. Self-leadership is the ability to lead oneself or to lead the organization through a process uh, to achieve a common set of goals. It's built upon the definition of leadership. Leadership uh, is defined as the ability to influence a group of people to achieve a common goal. So when you talk about self-leadership, whether it's about an individual or an organization or an institution or a group of people and they're trying to become self-leaders in their own right, we're talking about themselves leading themselves uh, to achieve a goal that they have set for themselves without any uh, influence from external factors that will cause them to perform or lead. What this simply means, and we're going to work, work through this in a moment, this means that you're not making decisions based upon uh, external factors that are creating peer pressure or forced decisions. You're making decisions based upon this process that begins with a core set of beliefs 
Okay, it begins with your mindset. It begins with what's going through the mind of the organization, its leaders, its internal influencers, whether it's your board, it's your senior staff or its middle management or even frontline management. Perhaps uh, you may be influenced by your your customers and how they may be impacting uh, uh, they how they may be uh, in, in integrating or in being how they are involved rather. Uh, with the program, and that may deeply influence how you make decisions. However you come to that decision, it all begins in the mind, these core sets of beliefs, the philosophical world, the psychological world with which decisions are made, with, with, with which beliefs are built, with which self-talk is happening, and with which imagined experiences are being cultivated. All of that makes up mental images, mental uh, decisions that are being made up top. When you're there, you then develop a core set of patterns that results in behaviors. Your thoughts result in behavior and your behavior then causes you to have interactions and influences with external forces called uh, uh, imagine experiences. And when you have these experiences out in the world where you're trying to understand the natural rewards rather. You're going to reinfluence your mind, which then reinfluences behavior, which then redefines and reinfluences how you have these experiences that you hope are positive, that are enjoyable, that are uh, giving you insight into the idea of what it means to lead oneself. Okay, so self leadership is all about the mind and the decisions made there. Secondly, it's about the behaviors. Third, it is about the uh, the the reinforcement of this idea that I can be positively impacted by what I'm going through, and am I going to enjoy this experiences, finding joy and happiness along the way. So that's the framework of the philosophy of self leadership. Now, when you have all of this working, uh, working with you, working around you, the self leading organization takes this to a higher level, right? When it is all about a group of people, no matter how big or how small the organization is, a group of people making decisions that says we, as a collective group, are going to develop a an idea. If a, a psychological idea of what we expect and what we want for our future, for our customers, for our stakeholders. From there, we're going to behave according to the ideas we cultivate. And when these behaviors are now uh, being expressed or presented in the outside world, we're going to take it to the outside world for feedback, for interaction, for understanding, to understand and to gain clarity on what it is that we're doing and whether or not we enjoy this. That's what it comes down to, guys. So this framework of understanding your operational philosophy begins with you having uh, built a culture of self-leadership within the organization. That the world itself, while we are going to present to the world and, yes, take the feedback we're going to get from the world to make adjustments, the idea of it all begins in the mind. It begins in the mind. It begins in the mind of the organization. It begins in the mind of the leadership. It begins in the mind of the board. It begins in the mind of all the influences, uh, influencers that have an impact on the organization. That's how it begins. Now, if you are building the organization from the ground up and you're trying to figure out how do you introduce this to your organization, the first thing you can do that's most important is for you as a singular leader. You as a singular leader must be able to express and live out self-leadership first. You have to be the first partaker of what self-leadership is. If you're unable to express self-leadership or to live out self-leadership, then it's going to be super difficult for you to understand how to teach other people to do this very thing. How do you teach people uh, within your organization to be a self-leader if you don't understand how to frame your own thoughts or to come to conclusions that involve a belief system, self-talking, and an imagined experience where you are envisioning a future that's totally different? How do you teach other people within the organization to be a self-leader if you don't allow your thoughts 
to be cultivated and result into a behavior. How do you teach other people to be a self-leader if you're not allowing your behaviors to go out to the world for some sort of exchange where you can find the reward process? The reward process that says I'm not necessarily affirming or not affirming my beliefs and behaviors. Rather, I'm trying to understand what it is that I find naturally rewarding about this experience that creates me, uh, creates within me a burden philosophy. A philosophy that burdens me to perform and behave in a certain type of way. And the world, when they experience you, regardless of whether they like it or not, will either harden this philosophy that you are cultivating or it will cause it to shift even further. Neither is good or bad, depending on what your approach is and why you're approaching it the way that you are. At the end of the day, you got to build this philosophy within and then teach others to do the same within your organization and this leads to defining the operational philosophy so for example you may be a youth serving organization and you may say that our core belief is that every young person within our city should be exposed to opportunity so that they can become better self-advocates for their future that is the core belief And because you have the core belief and you're developing this psychological world within the organization, that core belief says this is how we're going to do it. We start to talk to each other about this. We start to uh, talk uh, to our funders about this. We start to talk to our colleagues about this. And it becomes an internal conversation that we continue to cultivate. And then we begin to imagine a future where our young adults are advocating for themselves in the future. Why does this even matter? Before we start acting on it, this matters because our young people, as they're able to advocate for themselves, they are no longer prisoners to their situation and their circumstance. Even if their parents are not necessarily supporting their growth, even if their parents are not necessarily helpful in in helping them think differently about their future. Even if their parents don't know how to uh, create a different future that leads to a different life and set of life choices. And an interaction with our program allows our young people to understand that opportunity is well beyond the realm of their community and the perceived limitations their community presently presents. And if they are exposed to these opportunities, then we can teach them how to become self-advocates. Great. So now we have this mental idea floating around in our organization. Now we're going to behave accordingly as an organization. We believe that young people should become self-advocates, so we're going to design programs that believe that, that follow that belief, programs that build upon that, that build self-leadership within them, that teach them how to process and make critical decisions, to assess information, to make decisions that lead to positive outcomes, and to build the internal fortitude that leads to a specific outcome that they're targeting. So we're going to do this based upon key performance indicators our funders currently support. What are those? Off the top of my head, absenteeism dropping amongst our young people, suspension dropping amongst our young people, grades improving, high school enrollments up, college enrollments up, two-year institution enrollments up, enrollment uh, in trade schools up, deciding to go to work and having uh, sustainability at a job, being there for a while to learn the job and to grow in the job up. Reduction uh, in arrest and justice involvement down. Right. These are the things that matter. These are the key indicators that are going to help us define and describe a program. So our uh, psychological world says we will do this because we believe that every young person should be a self-advocate. So we develop a behavioral set behind this by designing programs, instituting research and best practices, whether our own or others that helps define these programs. And then the natural reward process that allows us to go out into the world to test these ideas will inform us even further. Our philosophy is not going to change in terms of what we want for our young people, but what may change may be how we deliver it. So the young people, uh, they will vote with their feet and they will tell us if what we've designed is working or not. And we will go back through this cycle, reaffirm our thinking and redesign a program or programs until we get it right. That will yield results for our young people. This is how a self-leading organization operates. It begins in the mind. It results in behavior. And then the natural reward process is when you're presenting your behavior to the world for feedback, for information or affirmation or change. 
So that's how you become a self-leading organization. We're talking about defining your operational philosophy. So after you develop your self, uh, develop your organization becomes self-leading, then you have to now talk about or identify how does this self-leadership concept lead to a philosophy that serves three critical customers. Well, who are those customers? Well, number one, your leading customer will be your funder. Second customer will be the ones who are enrolling in your program. In this case, the scenario is young people. And then third, it will be external stakeholders, third-party stakeholders, people who care about the outcomes you're achieving. And so as you interact with these various customers, no matter who they are, what their interests are, the interaction you have with them is all influenced by this self-leadership culture you're developing. That every interaction we have is designed to improve upon our ability to build young people who are self-advocates, who understand how to advocate for themselves and their future. We're working with funders who believe in the same philosophy. We're working with young people and customers who want to build upon this philosophy. And we're working with third-party stakeholders who also support this philosophy. This is how you begin to define your operational philosophy, guys, that it's two part, right? Becoming a self-leading organization and going through that process that we talked about from uh, from Charles Mann's, uh, Christopher Neck and Charles Mann's. But then also moving towards the idea that this philosophy we're working on allows us to be responsive to our funders. The young adults who are going to enroll in our program or whoever your target customer is. And the stakeholders who care about this as a third party who want to be a part of this. So I hope this helps you move a little closer and defining your operational philosophy. We're going to open up the stage on Clubhouse for folks to come up and talk about this further. But I hope that this helps you begin uh, to think about and, re and define, in some cases, refine your operational philosophy so that you're building the right type of relationships with organizations, with people, with institutions that have the same value set that you have, who have the same ideas that you have, who have the same hopes and aspirations that you have, who have the same belief systems that you have. You're building this nonprofit organization to do something special, to do something great. And the absence of a clear operational philosophy will cause you to build relationships with all types of individuals who may not be the right fit for what you're trying to accomplish. At the end of the day, all that we're doing, everything that we're building is designed to be responsive to the needs of our customer, helping them achieve and obtain their transformation, helping them achieve and obtain the goals that they've set for themselves, helping them become the best version of themselves as humanly possible. With that being said, guys, we're going to wrap this podcast and we're going to encourage you uh, to stay connected to this podcast. For everyone who's listening to this podcast, we're going to we want to remind you of the uh, the nonprofit fundraising masterclass. We have open enrollment for our upcoming cohorts that begins the top of every month. And if you want to join our nonprofit fundraising masterclass, we're going to encourage you to submit your application to nonprofitfundingstrategies.com. Now, why did we create this particular masterclass? We created it because we wanted to have a program for leaders, uh, for, uh, for nonprofit leaders, created by nonprofit leaders to help you simplify your fundraising approach. And even what we talked about today around developing your operational philosophy, some of you have been struggling with identifying the right type of funder to come to bring on board or to find the right type of funder that's a fit for you and your organization. A part, that fit, that struggle for a fit is because your philosophy is not defined or not clearly defined and or it is defined and you are pursuing organizations who are just not the right fit for you. So if you want to frame that out, if you want to talk about and learn how to develop your fundraising approach without chasing funders, you want to simplify, then join the Nonprofit Fundraising Masterclass. All you got to do is submit your application at nonprofitfundingstrategies.com. Again, that's nonprofitfundingstrategies.com. And we'll be glad to evaluate your application. And uh, we don't work with everyone, but we do uh, admit a small group in for every cohort. And my hope is that you submit your application. My hope is to work with you 
to help you achieve your fundraising goals.